we're built to walk uphill. And when you reach the pinnacle of the hill, you want to stop and appreciate the vision, but the next thing you want is a higher hill in the distance because it's the uphill climb that, it's, it's from the uphill climb that we derive our value, and I mean this technically. So almost all the positive emotion we feel, especially the, 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 the emotion that fills us with enthusiasm, and that's to be filled with the Spirit of God, by the way, because that's what enthusiasm means. That's experienced in relationship to a goal. And so in some sense, and this is part of the religious enterprise, you want a goal that you can never attain, right? So you can always move closer to the goal that recedes as you move towards it. You think, well, that's frustrating. It's like Sisyphus pushing the rock uphill. But it's not because as you pursue that goal, you put yourself together and your life does get better and richer and more abundant. And that's why the highest levels of virtue and goal are in some sense transcendent. You want them to be above everything you're doing so you can continually move towards something that's more sublime and better. That's what you are. You're, you're here to live, not to, not to sleep. And the problem with the vision of Mai Tais on the beach is that, well, first of all, that's, an that's a vision of, of drug-induced unconsciousness. Second, it's only going to work for about a week. Third, you're going to be a laughing stock in a month and depressed and aimless and, and goalless. It's no, that's not, it's, it's, you want a horizon of ever expanding possibility. And so it does happen to people as they, because they've staked their soul on the attainment of an instrumental goal. And it, it can be a pretty high order goal, it was in your case. Yeah. But then you think, well, I've, now I'm there, now what? Well, the answer can't be, well, I'm going to live in the lap of luxury and never have to leave the faith. What do you want to be, a giant infant with a gold, with a gold bottle, you never have to do anything but lay in your back and suck. It's like, well, you see the problem with that as a as a as a conceptualization. It's no, you want to be like an active warrior moving uphill with your sword in hand, and that's that's dynamic, that's exciting, and that's why so many young men disappear into video games. It's that's all acted out in the video game. So they have to act that out in their own life. Thrownness is the fact that we kind of experience life as if we're tossed into it, thrown into it. You know, you're you're male and not female. You're you're Hindu and not Christian. You're tall and not short. You have an arbitrary range of talents and an arbitrary range of limitations. None of which, in some sense, you chose. It's the cards you're dealt. Now, some of those are cards of privilege. No, maybe you're born intelligent. Maybe you're born symmetrical. Maybe you're born healthy. Um, maybe you're born into a culture where it's much easier not to be absolutely deprived. Maybe your parents are rich. And so all of that in some sense is unearned. Now, along with that comes a good dose of existential guilt because at the same time, and this is true for anyone, regardless of their cultural background, the ground we walk on is soaked in the blood of historical atrocity and so that's on you because you know people think well who's the nazi well it's the fascist or it's the or who's the radical communist it's the radical left-wing ideologue and the fundamental truth of the matter is that's best dealt with as a spiritual matter is the adversary is within really most profoundly. And so you have to take the responsibility for that historical atrocity onto yourself. I was talking to Guy Ritchie this week about his movie King Arthur. It's quite an interesting movie in many ways. And when Arthur, who could be the hero, takes the sword, he's so overcome by visions of his murderous uncle that he can't pick up the weapon. Well, think about that. Now you have weapons at your disposal, but They've been used by your murderous uncle. How dare you wield them? And the answer is, maybe it's easy just to leave the sword on the ground because you do want to be responsible for atrocities going forward and don't think you couldn't be and don't think you might not enjoy it. And so, the way you pay for your privilege is with your virtue. I mean that most particularly. You have these opportunities and this existential guilt. 
And the way you expiate that and atone is by doing your best to live the best possible life you can manage, to speak the truth, to treat people with respect, to abide by the principles of the dignity of the individual and to put your house in order. And that's how you pay for your unearned privilege, all of us. And we all have our privileges and our, and our curses, you know, all of us have that. That's why it's not useful to be envious of people. You know, you see some, you're a young man, you see someone drive by in a Ferrari with a blonde and you think, my God, he's got everything. And you know, the woman in the car is a prostitute who's got a cocaine addiction and her, her life is just one catastrophe after another. And he's had to lie and cheat his way into this position. And he's afraid that everything's going to come crashing down on him. And that's what you're jealous of. And it's just not that profound. You don't want someone else's fate. Man, your fate's enough. And your adventure's enough. It's plenty. It's more than you can ever fully realize. And so that's also part of the reason that we all believe that the individual has some intrinsic dignity. It's don't be so sure that your position and your room is so damn trivial. It might be your attitude towards it that's trivial. And if you're in dire straits and dire circumstances, just look at how much opportunity you have to make things better. that question with good intentions mm -hmm. are you happy what's a better question for me to ask jordan peterson how are you doing how are you doing mm -hmm. how are you doing brilliantly and terribly that's You know, when you listen to a profound piece of music, one that sort of spans the whole emotional experience, it's not happy. Happy is elevator music, and probably you just shouldn't listen to that at all. Right? And, and you think, why? Well, it, it, it's harmless, it's treacly, it's sweet, uh, it's simple, it lacks depth, it's shallow, that's a problem. Um, It doesn't have that deep sense of awe and horror, I would say, that is characteristic of the best of all music. You know, you listen to some mis simple music, so-called. Hank Williams is a good example. You know, the blues cowboy from the 50s who died of alcoholism when he was 27 and whose voice sounds like an 80-year-old man. Simple melody, you know, but there's nothing simple in the song and, and in the voice. It's deep, you know, it's like the blues. It's, it's like black blues in the States from the 20s, and it was certainly influenced by that tradition. There's this admission of a deep suffering at the same time as you get the beautiful transcendence of the music. And that's meaning, you know, that's awful in the most fundamental sense, but you need an antidote to suffering, and it has to be deep. And you know, deep moves you tectonically, and it's not a trivial thing. And But that's better than happiness. And maybe if you're lucky while you're pursuing that and while you're immersed in it, you get to be happy, and, and you should fall on your knees and be grateful for that when it happens. You know, it's a gift. It really is a gift. And it comes upon you unexpectedly, your happiness, you know. But, you aim to climb uphill to the highest peak you can possibly envision. And that's, that's better than happiness. <laughs>